Welcome to this episode of Crossheads, uh, the weekly program where we discuss the most important uh, issue uh, in national or international security affairs uh, with columnists and journalists for the print. And this uh, week we have Adil Brar, who those of you who read the print regularly will know. Adil is a China scholar an expert uh, familiar with the region and its language, who is currently studying in London. And Swasti Rao, who again, those of you who follow the print will know from her videos and her column, um, who's uh, at IDSA in New Delhi, and an expert on the geopolitics of the region. Um, So I'll kick off with you, Adil, if I may. And my first question is this, this tantalizing reference coming out of the CPC Congress uh, in she's published uh, a report uh, talking about preparing for winning regional wars. Uh, what does this? What does this? Mean? What does it mean for India? I think this particular term that he used, uh, regional war, has been quite often, uh, you know, mentioned in terms of Taiwan since 2016, since the reform started of the PLA. And we've seen that this reference also has been used in context of borders that China has. So when they talk about localized wars, they mean that, you know, controlling the outcomes of the war, controlling what happens after, you know, war starts or a conflict starts so that it does not become like an international conflict in which U.S. might jump in. So that's a scenario that Xi Jinping is looking at when they want to uh, might take over in the future, you know, take over Taiwan or have a war with India at the border. So they want to control the outcome. And that's the primary um, reason why they talk about localizing the war by not taking it out of the you know realm of what China can really manage. So but just the other thing, up yeah. if I may interrupt for a second, Adil, does that, does that mean China actually believes it will be fighting uh, regional wars on either of its borders in some sort of foreseeable time frame? Or is it only a hypothetical matter of preparation to wage such conflicts? I think we have to look at it in terms of preparation. You know, China's comprehensive power has grown, so they feel that there could be a scenario in the future that they have to defend their national interests. So China wants to be the next hegemon, so there are certain things that they'll have to defend so therefore, they have to prepare for any kind of scenario that any emerging power would think about. So we have to think about in terms of that. But in case of Taiwan, we know they talk about, you know, seizing Taiwan or sort of uh, merging Taiwan into mainland. And we don't know. I don't want to go into the whole debate about when there'll be a war on Taiwan and all of that. But we should look at it in terms of a real scenario, not really hypothetical scenario, something that China might face in the future. Swasti, if you might unpack this for us a little bit. On the one hand, we've had some very uh, angry words from Indian leaders and politicians on China. But at once, this effort diplomatically through military to military contact to diffuse and end this conflict. Um, Is India still optimistic of arriving at a resolution of, of the situation on the LEC? Or is it just buying time? Um, in 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 the, you know uh, and and hoping that the problem somehow goes away. What is the Indian response to this situation it's confronted with? See, uh, the way I look at it is, and the way I understand it, I think that first we need to understand where India figures in the Chinese imagination of being a threat, you know, so to say. So I I have I have a sense that uh, India does not figure in the same, and I'm, I think Adil would perhaps know more on this, that India does not figure in the same A-list of threats, okay, as Japan and the United States does. So with India, uh, you know, I, I guess it's more like a Chinese tactic of uh, trying and uh, sort of, uh, you know, making us waste our time, making us, you know, um, um, remain preoccupied with what is happening at the LAC so that uh, we are contained in our own, uh, so to say, problems. So I guess it's been it's been more like that. From the Indian side, obviously, we all understand that it can never be business as usual with China again. Having said that, that the trade figures also suggest that the trade has its own uh, logic. So 
to cut a long story short, I think I would perhaps say that um, right now, I do not see that there seems to be a complete or total resolution or solution to this problem as we stand today and with Xi Jinping returning. But uh, one of the things that I will say, as, as Adil also said, that uh, you, know, you need to understand as to how do you read this Xi Jinping coming back and how do you read the future of uh, China's uh, you know, different policies, particularly economic policy. And I was doing a reading on that. And it does seem as if that there has been a shift in China's economic policy because of all the COVID uh, restrictions of zero COVID, uh, etc. restrictions out there. You know, they are in a sense, uh, at least under Xi Jinping, it so looks that they, they are shifting from um, um, you know, from, from reform and opening up and just, you know, kicking up the, the trade figures to self-sufficiency. And why do I say that? It's nothing new. I think this has been around for a long time. But what happens is that, you know, if, if this becomes the new mantra, uh, what happens is that, um, you know, in, in, in the current scenario of where the world is and going and with the, with the wars happening, etc., you know, one of the things where I had a sense of Xi Jinping really making a lot of sense with respect to what is going on in Ukraine, for, for example, is that, you know, I had these repeated conversations with a lot of Europeans and they said that uh, they are trying to sort of behind closed doors, trying to have this particular understanding that if Xi Jinping can bring about a halt or a stop or an end to the war in Ukraine in a way which is favorable to the West, they might you know, then uh, uh, be better, uh, so to say, prepared to take forward the economic interests that China has with Europe that have been dwindling for a long time. But then having said that, that seems to be a major enough, I would say, um, you know, point for Xi, Xi Jinping to, to understand because, you know, the European Union is such a mega trading partner for, uh, for Xi Jinping. And then, you know, there is a trade deal which is stuck for a long time, etc., uh, so, so having said that, I, I see that there is going to be a change in this kind of a policy. Let And then I'm also interested in seeing how this is going to play out okay, in the current context of what is happening in Ukraine. And third, whether this would mean that, um, you know, this implicit understanding that, that, that the CCP ruled its people with, which is that, you know, we, you let us rule and we will make you rich. This probably would not work in the coming days as much as it worked earlier. And then it could capitalize, that could push Xi Jinping to capitalize more on nationalist causes. Of course, Taiwan is uh, everybody's guess, but then LAC also could uh, you know, figure that, though I think it is very low on priority. So, Adil, I mean, interesting points uh, Swasti made there. And one I would like to draw you out a little bit on this is, what do the Chinese actually hope for by, if you like, slapping India on the wrist on the LAC? This territory is, after all, inconsequential for them. Uh, it seems to serve the purpose of pushing India closer into the Western orbit, which presumably the Chinese don't want. Uh, and finally, uh, there, you know, there, there, it isn't that China is looking to conquer um, uh, Kolkata or Delhi uh, tomorrow, even in 1962, uh, they didn't push uh, west of their own claim line. What, what is the Chinese objective on the LAC? Uh, thank you for that question. And as I think Swasti rightly pointed out that, you know, there is India is never really the top threat for China. It's been the US. Um, but Increasingly, India plays an interesting role in the geopolitical context where India could be the next major economic superpower, you know, producer of small uh, equipments and other uh, manufacturing hubs that could come to India. That actually unnerves the Chinese, especially in the top leadership. So there's some concern about maintaining some kind of asymmetry versus India so that you know, China maintains an edge that India does not eventually take over and at least replace certain sectors uh, that India can manage to replace China in. So that's one of the uh, aspects that I would think about in terms of the border conflict that we have right now. Um, definitely the on the ground context would be the infrastructure that's coming up on the Indian side, maintaining asymmetry in context of that. But we cannot deny the fact there is a broader geopolitical reasoning behind why China wants to maintain the asymmetry by pulling in Indian troops to the border, by pulling in Indian resources, which could have been used for a lot of different things, manpower, bureaucracy, which is now kind of tied to 
addressing this China challenge that we have at the moment. And China actually knows this very well. They understand our bureaucracy, how it functions and how it can be tied down. And I personally believe there is a reason that we can connect the dots and we can understand why this border standoff is happening at the moment. Why is China trying to invest in maintaining this asymmetry versus India? So that is one context, as well as we need to look at what Taiwan-India connection is. Uh, this has come up in some of the Chinese scholars writing to talk about, you know, fighting two front war when they might have to confront Indian troops at the Indian border with maybe a Western alliance versus, you know, they might be on the Taiwanese side. So that's the kind of broader context that they are preparing for in the future. So I, we don't have any exact documents from the top leadership to corroborate these kind of uh, arguments, but the experts, you know, in the universities and think tanks do talk about this kind of scenario. So we have to look at that as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, Swasti, given that this situation of pressure looks like it's going to last for a while. Uh, as, as you mentioned, Xi Jinping is back. What are India's options here? So as Adil was just pointing out, we're in a situation of committing enormous amounts of resources uh, to the line of actual control. Uh, we've actually moved out troops who would have been deployed normally to safeguard against Pakistan uh, yeah. now towards guarding our eastern borders. Uh, and this, uh, at a time of economic crisis, when you know the government has been struggling to meet uh, 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 demands for military modernization, and anyway, Prime Minister Modi over many many years has you know kept a sort of cap uh, to military spending. Uh, do you foresee India allowing itself to get sucked into uh, some larger uh, uh, military commitments here? Or is India going to try some way to get around the, the problem? What is your assessment? Uh, well, with respect to the LAC problem, like I said, that uh, one cannot expect that status quo uh, like it existed before April uh, 2020 would just resume. I don't think that's happening. And I think the Indian leadership has been pretty forthcoming in saying that. But having said that, I think the situation, uh, not just the COVID, the, the long lockdowns uh, that COVID brought and uh, the kind of uh, economic downturn it brought in global economy, but also uh, the ongoing uh, war in Ukraine that has just uh, sort of upended almost all strategic calculations calculations, okay, world over. I think both these things are, um, uh, would tell us that it's not just India that would sort of shy away from uh, committing too much uh, resources and personnel along the LAC, particularly, I mean, in terms of getting into some sort of a, uh, you know, escalation of tensions. But I think it is very much in the interest of China as well. I mean, let's understand that China's economic growth has been uh, pretty low compared to, I think it's, it's, perhaps, um, I think, 2% down or something. I, I was just checking the figure somewhere. So it's it's a concern for them. It is, uh, like I said, uh, you know, their, their, their trade, uh, you know, is not going fine there. They have, they definitely seem to have a problem with how their own, uh, uh, you know, pressures are mounting with respect to their real estate issues, their, uh, the, uh, this widening gap between the rich and the poor. Of course, there are certain uh, achievements that Xi Jinping can definitely boast of, you know, in the last, whatever, 10 odd years. But the fact is that China also is not really in the best of, uh, so to say, uh, both the worlds, right? Especially with the with the, with the problems and with this uh, with this almost uh, difficult to understand insistence on the zero COVID uh, lockdowns, which has restricted travel, which has cut down demand, etc. So, like for example, one of the things that I can tell you is that. Um, so, you know, China has been uh, uh, getting so much extra gas uh, and oil from Russia and they've been, a lot of gas has been actually getting resold to Europe by the Chinese. So um, just, I think a few days ago, um, uh, the the state controlled banks, right? Uh, the, the, the state controlled, um, you know, these um, uh, gas companies were told to sort of halt their sales to Europe, okay? Uh, because they are worried about their own uh, winter and stuff. So this is not just like this one thing. All I'm saying is that pragmatism is going to rule uh, the kind of challenges that China has today. Uh, at the end of the, at the end of all discussions, right? I mean, one has to understand that what goes on in Xi Jinping's mind or what goes on in authoritarian governments is pretty much a black box. So all we are doing is conjecturing, but then looking at the, 10 year old, uh, you know, legacy that Xi Jinping has given us, it definitely makes us easier to sort of predict. So one of the things that I see 
is that uh, getting way too involved with, for example, LAC, at, at, at least with respect to the Indian question, I do not think that is the priority on uh, Xi Jinping's mind, and neither is it the priority on India. Uh, what, But what is priority for India would be to sort of try and carry on with a strategic autonomy, because we see, we as a country, we want to avoid the cost of uh, strategic alignment. And that is why we are trying to uphold strategic autonomy so much. So we are, we are, we will continue doing that. We will uh, continue engaging the relevant players for our continental problems with that, like we've been doing. And we will be going to be, uh, we will go, uh, you know, continue to engage uh, another set of players in the Indo-Pacific for our uh, maritime concerns and, uh, you know, aspirations. So that kind of a balancing is something that we will continue uh, to see. The one thing that would perhaps determine uh, a bit of more clarity on where or how far is China going to sort of um, challenge the American-led world order, uh, I think into my mind comes from two things. One is this, uh, uh, how will China operationalize this no limit friendship that it said it has with Vladimir Putin, which if you look at the last SEO summit and the um, address made by Xi Jinping there, it was very, very dull. It was almost, uh, I would say, uh, I mean, it was almost nothing compared to the uh, February, uh, you know, joint statement that the leaders came out with uh, when Xi Jinping had traveled to Beijing for the uh, Olympics. So that is one thing. I mean, how do they operationalize, right? Are they really willing to sort of support the Russians in any tangible way? So far, they have done nothing to sort of uh, invite the second Rebex Western sanctions. Okay, so so far they've done nothing. They've been extremely careful. They continue to be so. So that is one marker which will tell us how far China is going to sort of disrupt uh, the Western liberal order in tangible terms. Uh, that's one. Uh, and the second thing perhaps uh, would be as to what sort of a what sort of an equation th does China get into when it comes to trying to get the Europeans on their side, right? Because that is also somewhere key to understanding how they are going to be looking at their economics. Because if you if you remember. Uh, when I started out, I said that I sense a kind of a shift in how Xi Jinping has been doing his economics. Okay, so if it is economy after all, then things would be rather predictable. Uh, but if not, you know, then I would perhaps see that in the space, in that space, I would see the nationalistic rhetoric and all of that coming back. So that would not be very good news, you know, so to say for India. But uh, but yeah, so I mean, I'm just making the the, the point that I was making in the in initially that it's going to be much more pragmatic and rational than we expected at the outset. So a, a final question uh, for you, Adil, and. Uh, Two lessons I would have thought Xi Jinping would be learning um, from Ukraine is firstly, you never know where uh, the goddess of war takes you. Uh, asymmetry of resources it does not guarantee victory. Um, and the second is that having launched a war um, or begun a war, uh, the political consequences can be very unpredictable as they are for Vladimir Putin right now. Uh, do you believe uh, that at this party congress and in the debates around it, we've seen any rethinking on this from uh, Chinese elites or is the hawkish language on regional war in fact indicating which way China is going to go? I think they have to kind of maintain the rhetoric as nationalistic as it comes because the internal disputes that still exist within the elite groups are there so they cannot kind of climb down from the rhetoric but i think there is quite a bit of learning going on as you pointed out after ukraine that you know you cannot just start a war across uh, the strait with taiwan and especially it's a different context altogether it's an amphibious assault which is very different from a land assault like what putin had in russia ukraine context so i i'm pretty sure the experts or you know think tankers within the chinese context are learning from this so but the rhetoric that we heard from xi jinping during the speech was going to be nationalistic because it's for the domestic audience like we've seen during the national day in the past that's what he kind of does so but keeping that rhetoric aside i'm pretty sure that they're not going to be taking it so lightly that they might have in the past before russia ukraine happened so they are making their own um, assessments based on this. There's actually an interesting uh, report in Nikkei Asian Review, which I'm not sure about if it's uh, you know verifiable or not, but this report says that the internal systems in China 
uh, assessed that they could lose up to two trillion dollar in economic, um, you know, progress because of the Taiwan attack if they go for it. So that is a number that they can, you know, quantify and look at. So they are for sure looking at this whole global context and assessing how bad things could get. But at the same time, Xi Jinping is talking about becoming self-reliant. He's talking about becoming self-reliant, especially in food context, so that they don't have to rely on international food chain. And other natural resources are important for Xi's calculation as well. So that whole rhetoric about becoming self-reliant was building up before the Ukraine war. So I think the whole Ukraine war context did change their assessment about how they would have approached Taiwan. So they do want to um, work with Taiwan in the political context, you know, influencing local elections. So that remains their primary goal still. I haven't seen any signs which would suggest that they are preparing for war. Yesterday, I think the U.S. naval uh, officer said, oh, we should look at maybe a timeline end of this year that China might take Taiwan or maybe next year. But I think those assessments are blown out of proportions because we saw with how the Americans could predict the Russian war by looking at what was going on the ground. And we'll have a lot of signs when that actually happens. So I don't see any of those signs yet. Thank you, Adil. Uh, thank you, Swasti, for making the time, uh, first of all, to join us. I know you're struggling between columns uh, for the print and another uh, video show. And Adil, I know you're in another time zone, so I will leave both of you in peace to get on with your work. Um, thank you for joining me and thank you for being on Crosshairs. Uh, I hope those of you who are watching this program will make the time to join us again next week. Uh, have a great Diwali. Thank, thank you. Thank you.